Hi, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm excited to introduce this virtual event with Francis Fukuyama and Matilda Fasting presenting their new book, After the End of History, Conversations with Francis Fukuyama. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually today. Through virtual events like this afternoon's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. We're hosting events every weeknight right here on Zoom. And just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com. We can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. Today's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase after the end of history on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm honored to introduce our speakers. Francis Fukuyama is the Olivier Nominelli Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spoli Institute for International Studies, the director of the Ford Dorsey Masters in International Policy, and the most Bakker director of FSI's Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. He has written widely on issues related to de democratization and international political economy, including his seminal work, The End of History and The Last Man. His most recent book is Identity, The Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment. Joining him in the conversation is Matilda Fasting, a project manager and fellow at Civita, one of Norway's most influential think tanks where she regularly hosts its weekly podcast. Her published works include Freedom of Choice, The Citizen and the Community, and Torkel Ashug and Norwegian Historical Economic Thought, reconsidering a forgotten Norwegian pioneer economist. Today, they'll be discussing their latest work, which revisits Francis's seminal The End of History through a series of in-depth interviews conducted and edited by Matilda. In the intervening decades since its publication, the dominance of liberal democracy has given way to a global rise in populism and authoritarianism. The interviews in After the End of History encompass Francis's work on identity, biotechnology, and political order to help us understand how we arrived at this perilous point and how we might prevent the further decline of our democratic systems. Helena Rosenblatt calls the end of history, or sorry, after the end of history, a fascinating set of interviews offering an unprecedented insight into the mind of one of the most influential public intellectuals of our time. And Deirdre Nansen McCloskey says, Fukuyama here shows again that the telos of history is human dignity, not the state's boot on your face forever. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Francis and Matilda. Thank you so much. Uh, it's very nice to be participating uh, from Oslo. Uh, it's in the afternoon here, so um, but we are still awake and Oslo is still in lockdown, but uh, we hope to, to be coming out of the COVID soon. So, um, uh, I know that uh, Francis Fukuyama is many hours away, so uh, just say where you are. Oh, while I'm in Palo Alto, California, I'm really glad to participate in this. You know, for previous books that I've written, uh, I've spoken at the Harvard Bookstore, and I'm a big fan of independent bookstores. I, I really don't think they should all be closed down by Amazon, and I know they're under a lot of pressure. So I'm really happy to be able to do this event and to provide what support I can. Yeah, me too. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a great, great thing to, to be able to do this. And even though we are sitting in almost all, all corners of the world, we don't have anybody from Australia, but they are probably asleep right now. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, I would like to give a short introduction about the book, very short and brief, because uh, you might wonder why uh, uh, I, of all people in Oslo, Norway, should be interested in writing a book uh, about Francis Fukuyama and then, then thinking about what is it with his writings that, uh, that kind of fascinated me in the beginning. 
And as you probably know, Oslo is the capital of Norway and Norway is, um, what shall we say, uh, getting to Denmark, you have had a phrase, uh, Francis, but uh, getting to Norway might be as good. So I thought I was reading about, uh, about all the societies and the political order and uh, I was curious, what is this all about? And that brought me into your books and into your writings. And then finally we met and we started talking and um, that has become this book that's called now After the End of History because we cover almost well we cover everything since the beginning but at least everything that's happened and from 1989 and up to today and uh, i must say i thought uh, it wouldn't be necessary to defend democracy and its values uh, but i've come to the conclusion that really we have to do that and by when reading your books and listening to you and talking to you it made me understand that it's really more important than ever to do exactly that. And uh, as you also might know, during this process, we've had Brexit, we've had Trump and COVID. And I can tell you that the last time I saw uh, Francis Fukuyama was just about 20 days before COVID struck here in Norway. And uh, I don't really remember that we uh, thought it was such a big threat. We talked about it, but really uh, I couldn't imagine at that point that Norway and all Western countries would just come to a complete lockdown in such a short time. So um, that uh, is, we have to take that into account that the book was finished with COVID and COVID all around us, but also uh, a very important year for the US because there were the elections in the autumn. So um, I am quite sure that we will look back on 2020 and maybe 2021 as two pivotal years, but I'm not sure if we have an optimistic decade ahead of us. We'll have to see. Maybe you will help us, uh, Francis, if we can find some things to to look look onto and might uh, grab onto to survive and to, to keep going these liberal democracies. So um, without further ado, I have a couple of questions that I think it would be interesting to discuss. And um, I think that they might be relevant for today and maybe give us some hope and optimism for the future, although it's fair to say it's not going to be easy. So first, let's go on to, to social media, uh, Francis, because you have thoughts about that, and especially in your last book. And during the Trump presidency, it was really clear that social media has developed far from the situation that we talked about that was the origins of it in the early 2000s. And you've also been uh, involved in a project called Middleware. It's, uh, it's uh, something that's supposed to tackle social media in a way. So uh, let me, let me uh, just start with that. What do you think about social media now and in the future? And of course, what is Middleware? I think your microphone must become, you have to unmute. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, thanks Matilda for all the work that you put in in, in the doing the interviews and, and producing this book. Uh, so let me talk about uh, technology. I think that the issue is broader than social media. It really has to do with the entire media universe that's evolved uh, with the advent of the internet. Uh, Obviously, in the 1990s, when the internet was first commercialized, uh, most people, myself included, thought that this would be a big um, boon to democracy because information is power. And the one thing that the internet did was put much more information at the hands of ordinary people. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's been used repeatedly to mobilize people, to spread information, to break uh, monopolies over the control of information that had been exercised by governments and other powerful uh, organizations. But I think as time has gone on, uh, this dark side uh, has been revealed in many respects. First of all, uh, controlling the internet uh, was not as Bill Clinton once famously said, like nailing jello to a wall. Uh, it can be done uh, and it has been done by China uh, where actually its access to surveillance <clears throat> and big data has allowed it to create <clears throat> the social credit system that, uh, in which the government can monitor the minute behavior of 
uh, the vast majority of its citizens and used as a means of controlling them. Uh, but there are other um, uh, ways in which uh, you've had um, technology actually concentrate power rather than spreading it out. And, you know, I think that although we blame social media, uh, uh, legacy media does that. And particularly when legacy media is controlled by, let's say, oligarchs or, you know, certain political figures that have a political uh, agenda. Uh, this has obviously happened uh, to uh, in the United States with the rise of Fox News, but it's actually a more severe problem in the former communist world where uh, oligarchs had figured out that the easiest way to gain political power is to uh, buy a media empire uh, and control it to benefit their own political careers. This is something really invented by Silvio Berlusconi uh, when he became prime minister of Italy back in the 1990s. Uh, but then, uh, <clears throat> When you get to um, the current online world, I think that you get a, a different kind of problem that's become very evident in recent years, which is that although um, the big internet platforms, and basically there's only three of them, as Facebook, Google, and uh, Twitter, uh, the large internet platforms have a commercial self-interest in maximizing attention and holding um, the attention of their users, uh, which has biased them towards amplifying uh, a certain kind of material that's salacious, that's uncivil, that's you know oriented towards you know conspiracy theories, uh, anything that attracts attention. So, a factual recitation of um, you know information does not excite people, but uh, you know outlandish claims do, and I think that for that reason they have participated in the amplification of a lot of bad information. And this has been deliberately um, made use of by various uh, political actors that don't have the best interests of you know, uh, rational democratic deliberation at heart. Um, there's been a controversy among social scientists as to whether social media simply is following um, and is a creature of the underlying social polarization or whether it's actually driving that polarization. And I think as in most of, you know, instances like this, the causality actually does run both ways. And uh, it's clear that you know, social media has been able to amplify uh, certain kinds of voices and you know, make them uh, uh, louder and, and more heard. Uh, so, <clears throat> All of this, I think, has made um, uh, democracy much more difficult, you know, uh, beginning with the simple fact that um, we don't agree on the factual basis of information anymore. So, you know, there's been recent polling that indicates that 70% of uh, Republicans believe that Joe Biden stole the last election and that there was uh, massive fraud and that. Um, Biden is therefore not a legitimate uh, president. And this is really unprecedented, I think, in American history for that large uh, a number of American citizens to um, believe that there was, I mean, there's obviously fraud in previous elections, but this is fraud that's based on a deliberate lie. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's going to weaken the United States going forward uh, because, um, you know, that polarization that has emerged over the last couple of decades is really the sing single weakest, single greatest liability, I think, of America as a democracy. So this is a long, long-winded answer, um, you know, to your, uh, to your question. Yeah, but what about the middleware that you have been, uh, been, oh, um, yeah, yeah, just, just because that's might, might be a solution to this, or at least well, some kind of solution. Uh, it might be. Um, uh, about uh, a year ago, a little more than a year ago, I started a, um, a working group at Stanford. We have a new cyber policy center and uh, we wanted to look at the impact of um, the internet on democracy. Uh, and so I had a, a group that was originally titled the Antitrust uh, Working Group. But 
we came to realize that antitrust is really the wrong frame uh, uh, and the wrong tool to address the underlying problem. Uh, now, you know, living here in the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, it's been very interesting, the politics of the internet, because, you know, up until about two or three years ago, hardly anyone could find anything bad to say about, you know, Google and Facebook and all of these new internet platforms, because, you know, there was a widespread buy-in to the idea that they were helpful to democracy, but that's uh, completely reversed. And I think many people realize that the sheer concentration of power in these company, uh, companies uh, is a problem for democracy. Uh, it's a problem uh, economically. And for that reason, uh, the United States is now following Europe in pursuing antitrust uh, uh, suits against uh, uh, all of these companies. But as we started to think about it, we felt that the bigger problem that would not be uh, addressed by antitrust law was this political problem of the ability of uh, these media companies, or I'm sorry, the, the internet platforms to either uh, amplify or silence certain political voices. So, you know, primary case is that of Donald Trump himself, uh, who was kicked off of uh, Twitter two days after the January 6th assault uh, on Congress. Now, I personally found this a great uh, development because it's really been a pleasure since then not to have to deal with his <laughs> daily, uh, daily tweets. Um, and I think it solved a short-term problem of incitement you know, to, to violence. But you know, in the end, I don't believe that this is a sustainable solution. And you know, many observers, uh, basically liberal-minded observers from Angela Merkel to Alexei Navalny have questioned uh, whether a private company uh, should be entrusted with that kind of power uh, because they really don't have either the legitimacy or the capacity to make these kinds of important political decisions, not a privately owned you know, for-profit a company. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the idea of middleware was to outsource the curation of content away from these platforms and to try to create or facilitate the creation of a competitive layer uh, of other companies that would basically uh, curate uh, content uh, in place of the company. You know, so right now, uh, we have no idea the algorithms that uh, these big internet platforms use to feed us what they do. Uh, I was uh, surprised over the weekend, you know, at Amazon has got this list of books you might like at the bottom. And my list was um, Matt Gates, Janine Pirro, um, Lou Dobbs, Donald Trump Jr., uh, Devin New. I mean, I have no idea, you know, I've, I have no idea how their algorithm got from my browsing history. Uh, to this particular list of books. But in general, uh, those algorithms are completely non-transparent. And you know, the idea of middleware is to actually give control back to the users of the internet over uh, uh, what they see in their feeds. Uh, now, this is not going to solve the problem of polarization because I actually don't think that it's right for a single company to be able to, for example, simply ban uh, certain, you know, information just because it's a conspiracy theory or fake news. I mean, that's a bad problem, but we do have uh, the First Amendment in this country, which says that, you know, you've got a perfect right, you've got a constitutionally protected right uh, to say whatever you want, uh, you know, short of inciting violence. Um, and so uh, our middleware idea is not going to eliminate fake news and conspiracy theories, but it is going to give individuals more control over what they see and hear and take it away from these platforms. And that I think, you know, is good for democratic deliberation because it actually returns power to uh, individuals and, and takes it away from these concentrated sources of economic power. 
Yeah, let's uh, talk about Trump a little more because, you know, uh, one thing about this book and of conversations is that we really had to wait. Uh, the closer and closer we got to the 9th of November, we had to wait for this very, very uh, crucial election that was uh, that took place in the US. And Trump uh, was gone by that. And you just told me that that uh, people don't believe it, or many people believe it's it's a, it's a fraud. But uh, identity politics and populism is not gone. And uh, there might be it might be interesting to hear what your thoughts about these issues for well, let's say after Donald Trump. And if I may add, uh, will he uh, surface again in 2024? Uh, he's playing golf at the moment, I know, but uh, he might be doing other things as well. And um, this is also a question for, for there are other countries a little similar to, to Donald Trump or how, or how, or how they have leaders like Donald Trump. So if you put it into a little broader perspective as well. Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, my last book, Identity, uh, was published in 2018, really uh, in order to explain the Trump phenomenon. And what I argued there was that uh, for many countries, not just the United States, the main axis of politics had shifted from a fight uh, between a left and a right that was defined by economic ideology primarily uh, to one that was increasingly uh, defined by identity. And I argued that this is not a good development from the standpoint of democracy because you can you know, argue and compromise over economic policy, you know, whether tax rates should be higher or lower, uh, but it's very hard to um, fight over fixed identities that are defined by things like race uh, and gender and so forth. And you know, in the United States, because of our racial history, uh, the two parties which had been quite diverse, uh, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, have been increasingly, uh, you know, divided uh, uh, by race, where the Republicans were, you know, a heavily white party, and Democrats were heavily a party of women and minorities. Um, and so, you know, I think that was right, and I think there are also identity issues that, you know, did not have to do with race, but this fundamental divide in outlooks between people that tend to live in, you know, big uh, diverse cities and people that live, you know, outside of them, uh, where you've got you know, very different social values regarding patriotism and family and religion um, uh, that come into play. Uh, since that time, though, and particularly since the election last November, we've entered into much crazier territory um, where, uh, you know, what it means to be a Republican has shifted and you can't even use those identity categories any longer. I mean, for many Republicans, you know, what it means to be a Republican is actually to belong to this cult of personality of Donald Trump. I mean, this was illustrated in the Republican convention last October where the platform committee refused to write a platform and they basically said, well, you know, we Republicans believe whatever Donald Trump wants uh, um, uh, and completely abdicated, you know, any role in kind of setting an ideological or policy uh, agenda. Uh, and uh, now, you know, it appears that what it means to be a Republican is to believe that the last election was stolen, that the single most important policy issue in the facing the country is to reduce uh, non-existent voter fraud and, you know, to put all of your efforts into making it harder to vote so that this doesn't happen again. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a platform that one would think would uh, wear well <laughs> into the future and attract, you know, more and more uh, adherence, but uh, that's where they are. And I think it kind of, indicates why, you know, economists and policy analysts and political scientists like me are less useful in trying to describe what's going on. And you have to turn to social psychologists uh, because really some of these phenomena uh, can only be described by, you know, people that understand, you know, the power of ideas and group identities uh, 
because that seems to have displaced you know, the normal discourse about uh, you know, policy and ideas. I'll just have to just mention them, uh, Francis, that uh, uh, when you say we don't need you, we, we need we need your thoughts. So you don't you, you must continue <laughs> writing. And the other thing that you kind of uh, not said was that sociology is something that you uh, have come to to study quite a lot, even though it's not part of your formal education. It's something that you really see ever since you were were a small not maybe a small child but ever since you were a young man you have been fascinated by those ideas so maybe you could use some of that for for in your work for explaining what's happening uh yeah. i think that could be useful yeah it's funny my relationship with sociology my father was a sociologist and i think as part of my um uh, adolescent rebellion i swore to myself when i was younger that i would uh, never become a sociologist, um, and so I, you know, my degree was in uh, in, in uh, government, in the Harvard government department. Uh, but actually, over time, I came to realize that the the kind of knowledge that sociologists and anthropologists uh, have is actually among the most valuable in understanding how uh, societies work. It's subpolitical. It it really doesn't have to do with political institutions. It really has to do with norms and values and group interactions and cultural differences across um, different societies. I think that uh, for me, like for many other people, the biggest introduction to this was Alexis de Tocqueville uh, and his different writings, not just democracy in America, but um, you know, the old regime and the, and the revolution, uh, uh, you know, because he was basically one of the first sociologist. He described uh, in volume two of democracy, uh, I'm sorry, in, in volume one of uh, democracy in America, the formal uh, institutions of the US government, the constitution and how political institutions work. But I think his biggest contribution was in his ability to go around and talk to ordinary Americans and understand, um, you know, what he described as their habits um, uh, and morals, uh, which was really their normative beliefs and uh, the way they interacted and thought about things. And, uh, you know, his probably most famous observation was about the art of association, uh, this proclivity of Americans to join voluntary organizations and to be able to organize themselves in groups. And, you know, this um, has always struck me as, you know, incredibly uh, uh, insightful. He said similarly negative things about France, his native France as well. He said at one point uh, that there weren't 10 French people that could get together in a common enterprise because they were so distrustful of one another. Um, uh, so, um, you know, that's what made me pull out all of the sociology classics from Weber and Durkheim and Tennis and so forth that I inherited from my father and start reading them. And uh, you know, that's part of the way that I got to where I am today. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I thought thought uh, thought too. So, um, but let's turn a little bit to some international things going on. Uh, in the book, we talk a lot about China and Chinese policies, and also about the development in Hong Kong, and I would add possibly in Taiwan. Um, so, uh, what are your thoughts about? Uh, the situation uh, and also do you see the f uh, how do you see the future relations in this part of the world and of course also the, f the relation between Chinese and the, the Chinese and the United States so uh, all this complex of, of, uh, of things that's going on on the other side of the Pacific well I'm uh, very worried about this uh, I think that the one area where there's been actually very little change between Trump and Biden is in China policy. And I think there's a good reason for that. Uh, I think that it's not that uh, anyone in Washington is nostalgic for the Cold War, but after Xi Jinping's rise to power in 2013, China itself has changed um, in, in uh, I think, pretty dramatic ways. I think prior to Xi Jinping, you would have described it as a kind of ordinary authoritarian state. And 
you know, I visited China a lot uh, over the past 15 years. And, you know, prior to Xi's rise, uh, you know, in many ways, it had become a remarkably free society in which, you know, for example, my Chinese academic colleagues could criticize the government, they could, you know, provide gossip as to what they thought was really going on and have, you know, very interesting uh, arguments. And that simply is not true anymore, because she somehow seems to have a nostalgia for, you know, Maoism and for the Cultural Revolution. And he has deliberately reinserted the Chinese Communist Party into every facet of uh, Chinese life. And, you know, because of technology, uh, he actually is in a better position to create a true totalitarian state. I mean, this was an old distinction that was created by uh, Friedrich and Brzezinski back in the 1950s to describe the difference between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union and how it differed from, let's say, a Latin American military dictatorship. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know that he'll get there, but she is definitely pushing in that more totalitarian direction. And it has big implications for foreign policy because prior to Xi, most Chinese leaders followed Deng Xiaoping's, you know, maxim that they were building the uh, internal Chinese economy uh, and they were not interested in exporting anything like a China, China model. And that's different now. Uh, I think that, you know, with the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, a lot of things that Xi has undertaken like the militarization of the South China Sea, uh, they have a much more aggressive foreign policy. And I think, you know, one of the real big crises that Biden is likely to face uh, in his, you know, first term is over Taiwan. Because a couple of years, more than two years ago now, uh, she gave a speech in which she said that Taiwan will be reincorporated into China one way or the other within the next 10 years and already two years have clicked off of that uh, 10 year clock. Um, uh, and I think the, uh, you know, the coronavirus has uh, contributed or sped up that timeline. Uh, you know, back in uh, 1997, the Chinese had committed themselves to respecting uh, the independence of, uh, of Hong Kong when it passed back to them uh, from the British, and basically they simply went back on that promise uh, in uh, early 2020 when they extended their national security law uh, to Hong Kong and basically now have reincorporated it uh, into China and snuffed out, you know, um, any uh, kind of liberal uh, open uh, discourse there. Uh, so it's a very worrisome situation, and I think that uh, many observers are so used to thinking about East Asia in, you know, the old way, uh, and they cannot imagine the possibility that you could actually have uh, open military conflict there. But I think the pro you know, the prospects of that have risen very substantially uh, in the last eight years, but particularly in the last uh, in the last year itself. So uh, we're talking about military interventions. Uh, we might turn to another place where you have worked for a long time, and that's with people in Ukraine. And uh, I called it in the book a beacon of hope because you were positive. You said you like to go there and uh, to educate people there. But what do you think about the latest developments? And also, uh, if we include in that part of the world the Belarus, because uh, after. Well, last August, we know uh, there were elections there, and uh, we also know that Lukashenko is still still in there. So uh, what is happening in that part of the world? Well, I think Ukraine, uh, as well as Taiwan, are kind of the front lines of this global struggle uh, for democracy. Uh, you know, Ukraine had two uh, restarts. Uh, uh, the Orange Revolution back in 2004, which really failed, uh, and then the Maidan uh, Revolution of Dignity in 2013-14, uh, in which, and in both cases, um, you know, Ukraine demonstrated that it's actually got a real civil society that's independent of the government, that doesn't like authoritarian government, it wants to become a European country and adopt European uh, values. 
And uh, as such, it's really a threat to Russia and to, uh, uh, to Putin, who, first of all, does not believe that Ukraine is an independent country. He really thinks it's part of a, you know, of a greater uh, Russia, but uh, somehow thinks that, you know, his uh, traditions do not permit, you know, any kind of independent voices, that everything has to be controlled. Uh, by a strong central government, and Ukraine is proving that that's not the case. Now, um, the reason that I have been going to Ukraine, we, we, in my center at Stanford, we run a number of uh, uh, leadership uh, training programs, and you know, the one reason I've invested this much of my own time and effort there, it's not just Ukraine's frontline position in the struggle against Russia, but uh, it's also my personal experience because there is a big uh, entire generation of younger Ukrainians that really do want to make a firm break uh, with this Soviet Russian uh, past. Uh, and, you know, they really do want to make Ukraine a genuine um, European country. Uh, right now, apart from the Russian threat, which we've seen, uh, you know, in the Russian troop buildup that um, just occurred over the past month and their occupation of Crimea and the Donbass. Uh, apart from that, you know, the biggest threat to Ukraine's future as a democracy is the incredible level of corruption there. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's something that a lot of younger Ukrainians also really hate. Uh, you know, one of the legacies of the Soviet collapse was the fact that, you know, Ukraine uh, came under the control of six or seven uh, oligarchs uh, who profited uh, from the privatization that occurred back in the early 1990s and became uh, controllers of media empires. So basically all the mainstream media in Ukraine belongs to one, uh, one or more of these oligarchs. And it's very hard uh, to get, uh, you know, voices in, you know, truly independent voices that are not dependent on, uh, on an oligarch and they feed uh, the system of corruption. And so one of the things that really needs to be done uh, is to dismantle that system. Uh, that's why the whole <laughs> first Trump impeachment was such a dispiriting uh, development because Trump and Giuliani managed to locate the most corrupt people in Ukraine and claim that they were the anti-corruption fighters. I mean, it's, it's, I can't think of a you know, if you know anything about Ukraine, it's it's really calling black white, <laughs> and um, white black, uh, uh, and ended up you know positioning his administration on the side of uh, Putin and you know the pro-Russian forces uh, in Ukraine, um, and uh, therefore you know what happened in Ukraine uh, became a part of the internal. Uh, American struggle over American uh, democracy. And unfortunately, that first uh, impeachment, although I think it was richly deserved, uh, didn't work out. You know, Biden is trying to fix that. So I think as we speak this week, um, uh, our Secretary of State, uh, Tony Blinken, is going to be going to Kiev to try to deliver a twofold message, which is that, you know, the United States is on their side, but that that's conditional on their actually making some progress uh, against uh, corruption. Uh, and, you know, so the earlier problem was that we were on the wrong side of that struggle. Uh, now we're on the right side, but it's not clear, you know, that our leverage is going to be sufficient to, uh, you know, to win that, uh, that internal battle. Uh, but, you know, it's something that I think um, many American organizations, including my own, can contribute to in a small way. Yeah, uh, let's just uh, finish up before the audience uh, can ask questions. There are two last topics I'd like to, to discuss. Um, the first is, of course, um, we have to, have to know what you think about Biden and the first months of his presidency in last week. It was this, this 100 days and uh, his, uh, his speech. And then the second thing, of course, we cannot uh, have a discussion in the middle of COVID uh, and just not commenting on what that has told us about global politics and what do you think will be the long-term consequences of the pandemic? So let's start it with Biden. 
Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I actually think that the biggest uh, problems he's, you know, he, he could get very, very lucky uh, because uh, as the United States comes out of the uh, pandemic, uh, the economy, uh, because of the pent up savings and the stimulus, uh, plus the two bills that are stacked up behind the stimulus, the infrastructure bill and the American uh, Families Bill, you know, promise to inject a huge amount of uh, money and therefore demand into the US economy. And so the problem has uh, shifted dramatically from being high levels of unemployment and um, uh, low demand to the opposite, uh, where you actually could uh, see a return of inflation. But I suspect that that's not going to materialize uh, you know, for a while. We're already seeing a lot of pressure on upward pressure on prices, but I suspect that that's not going to be a, an acute problem. And so by the end of the calendar year, we could be at, you know, over full employment, rapid economic growth, uh, people will return to normal in terms of, you know, they're going to restaurants and meetings and returning to offices and so forth. And so the country could look like it's in pretty good shape, which will obviously help him. I actually do think that the biggest uh, pitfalls are in foreign policy because I think that uh, nobody in this country has really resolved how we're gonna handle this uh, situation with China. Obviously, nobody wants um, conflict with China, uh, but um, you know that may be uh, something that's not completely under our uh, under our control. As to the COVID question, uh, you know, I wrote an article last year on uh, the pandemic and what it taught us about what countries responded better. And since then, you know, I would have to completely rewrite that article because. <laughs> things have just gotten upended as time has gone on. So a country like Germany that last year looked like it was doing very well, this year looks terrible. India looked like it had dodged a bullet up in, you know, as little as three months ago, and now it's really the worst um, country in terms of new infections. Um, uh, I think in general, COVID has been very bad for democracy because it's given a lot of leaders an excuse to increase uh, uh, their executive powers, but on the other hand, it's also suppressed opposition and it's revealed weaknesses uh, in national leaderships. And so it could be that as the world returns to normal, uh, there'll be an upsurge in protests and demands you know, for political change. Uh, so there could be a more optimistic scenario uh, resulting. But uh, you know, my experience over the last, uh, whatever it is, 15 months has taught me <laughs> Not to not to make predictions prematurely in this uh, in this area. But we just have to follow you on American Purpose then and see what you uh, yeah. you blog because you have to tell the audience here that you are blogging and uh, and that's a good good thing to do because then you're contributing to 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 a democracy by by raising your voice and and discussing interesting things and people could could go there. So uh, we'll have to say it's a good contribution that you started blogging. Maybe you could tell us about COVID and the consequences yeah, well, later on. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just to, uh, if you just search on Frankly Fukuyama, that's the name of my blog on AmericanPurpose.com. So yes, I invite all of you to take a look. That's good. So uh, I think I would let the Harvard Bookstore uh, just take over and moderate the Q and A session. So uh, please, uh, please do that. Hello. All right, let me just get set up right here. Okay, so our first question is from James, who asks you to please address driver issues of social media appetite frustration. For example, in income inequality, scapegoating, globalization of manufacturing, et cetera. Uh, well, if I understand the question, um, properly, I think that, you know, social media really does tend to amplify certain voices. I mean, in some cases, this is good because you have a lot of marginalized communities that can connect with one another and, you know, make their voices heard um, uh, to other people in the mainstream. Uh, but it's also certainly um, 
increase this tendency. And, and this is again, where I blame the platforms because this is a matter of deliberate policy on their part. Uh, you know, it's made um, more extreme material more prominent because that's what, um, uh, that's what sells attention. Uh, and also it's turned out that, you know, a lot of people can game this system. So there was this period where on YouTube, for example, if you, uh, if you typed in, you know, white helmets, this was at the time of the intervention in Syria or at the height of the Syrian civil war, you know, the top 10 search results would all be things from RT from this Russian, um, Russia Today uh, uh, news channel that was, you know, providing a certain, uh, a certain line, uh, you know, the platforms have been under such great pressure that they've, you know, stepped up their efforts to control this kind of um, content. But I don't think they're really, you know, capable of that. I think that's why now part of this new Republican identity is to be anti-big tech because they think that this is all uh, directed against them. And so they put themselves in this, from a corporate standpoint, unenviable situation of, you know, having to please one of the other sides of this American uh, uh, polarization. But I do think it speaks to the need to actually take that power away uh, from them and, you know, hand it to, not to another party, certainly not to the government, but to a more diverse group of, you know, what I call middleware companies that can actually tailor uh, what people see to what they would like to see. That is a perfect segue into our next question, which is about midware. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit more about midware and how you think it will be successful in breaking up the monopoly that these powerful media companies have, not just over money, but information? Reviving user control over how they access information is key, but it also seems like there has to be a divestment in the companies that are so ubiquitous. Uh, sure. So, um, you know, when we put forward this idea, we couldn't answer two questions. And that's something that we're continuing to investigate. So the first question is a technological one about how far into the API these middleware firms would go. Uh, that is to say, uh, you could imagine a, a, a heavy version in which the middleware company would in effect offer a completely alternative user interface. And so instead of going to Facebook, you would access Facebook's data uh, through the middleware's uh, user interface. On the other hand, you could imagine a much lighter version in which the interface would be still the, um, that provided by the platform, but you know, the middleware would simply label things the way Twitter started to label things in the course of last year's uh, election campaign. There's actually a company out there called NewsGuard that sells a browser plugin uh, in which they rate the credibility of different uh, news sources. Uh, and it's offered as a service that you can purchase, you know, on a monthly basis. And they've got a deal with Microsoft to incorporate it into, you know, into the Bing search engine uh, and so forth. So that's the light version. And, you know, we know that the platforms would fight tooth and nail the heavy version. Uh, their attitude towards the light version is a little bit more complicated. Uh, but it also takes away less power from them, which is why they, you know, be less opposed to it. Uh, so that's one issue, and we don't have an answer to that. I think, you know, we'll start out with the light version and see uh, how that worked, and then, you know, reassess. The other issue is the business model. Uh, to create a, a middleware company actually would be an expensive proposition uh, to create a filter that would, um, you know, sort through the massive information out there on the internet, uh, and who's going to pay for that? Uh, it's not clear that users would find this a, a valuable enough service that they would pay, you know, whatever subscription fee uh, is necessary. And so uh, it would have to share revenue, ad revenues, or, uh, you know, a mandatory user fee, uh, you know, uh, and that couldn't happen except through some kind of regulatory uh, intervention. And so I don't think, you know, basically if the market could provide this kind of service by itself, it would have happened already. And the fact that it hasn't means that you probably need the government to back uh, middleware and force both the opening up of the 
platforms, APIs, and, and also to create a business model that would make uh, competition in this area sustainable. That makes sense. Um, I'm gonna follow this up with, uh, I think our last social media question, which says, doesn't the constitution say that the Congress shall make no law to prohibit free expression? Twitter is a corporation, a monopoly, yes, but not a branch of government. So doesn't it go back to antitrust and abridging their power? Uh, so, you know, the First Amendment in the United States only applies to the government. It does not apply to uh, any private party, including a large corporation. And so actually the First Amendment protects the right of Twitter to, uh, you know, to curate uh, things that appear on its platform uh, and to do it as uh, they see fit. And the only uh, real constraint is the ability of people privately to uh, sue them, which is why Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act was put in place because uh, you know, the creators of the modern internet didn't want private litigation to, uh, you know, to affect the platform's ability basically to uh, moderate content. And that's why the Republicans now have made ab abolition of Section 230, uh, you know, one of their chief uh, political goals. Um, I think, however, that that discussion isn't adequate to really kind of investigate the, the in, uh, you know, the, the impact on free speech, because yes, uh, Twitter does have this constitutionally protected right to moderate, but in a way it is so powerful at, as our Facebook and Google in terms of the way that all of us communicate that they have in effect, you know, made themselves the platforms for public political speech uh, in the United States. And so even though they're not part of the government, they are exercising government-like um, powers. Uh, and the last time this situation existed was in the days of over-the-air broadcast TV in the 1950s and 60s. And back then the government actually did see fit to, you know, force the major television networks to follow something called the Fairness Doctrine so that they wouldn't misuse that power, uh, you know, to privately uh, moderate uh, political discussions. Uh, we don't have the fairness doctrine anymore, but we do have the power of these private corporations. So uh, technically, yes, it is protected speech, but I think uh, as a political matter, you know, it is um, uh, a very troubling use of private power, which is why I think that power, that underlying power needs to be diminished. Great. All right, changing, changing topics. This question from Jan asks, how might we convince China to cooperate with efforts to mitigate climate change? Uh, you know, um, I don't think that uh, this is something that we're gonna have much uh, impact on uh, because there are very powerful uh, incentives that are pushing China uh, uh, to do to do things in this area. For example, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, where they're going to be spending a, a couple trillion dollars building infrastructure around the developing world. If you look at their energy pro projects, uh, you know, about 90% of them are fossil fuel based um, and they're building a lot of coal plants. They're gonna build a lot of new coal plants uh, around the world. Uh, and they're doing this um, uh, really in order to keep their own domestic workers uh, employed to give, uh, you know, something for their big construction companies, these state-owned enterprises uh, to do. And uh, in light of, you know, the kind of overwhelming economic self-interest that they've got in doing this, uh, I don't think that there's much that we can offer them other than a kind of fig leaf, you know, I mean, if we do something, then that gives them an excuse to you know, if they've got other reasons for doing it, that, that might give them a, a bit of an excuse to do things. But I don't think that we should kid ourselves about the uh, impact. And by the way, it's not just China. I mean, India uh, actually has, I mean, they've, they've made some moves in the direction of, you know, reducing carbon emissions, but uh, coal remains one of their most plentiful 
and cheapest uh, power sources. And they're planning to, you know, still put a lot of coal plants online. And so, you know, uh, between those two countries, you know, that's a large part of the future output of carbon. And I'm not sure uh, that the United States, you know, has anything close to the kind of um, influence that would be needed to really shift these incentives, uh, you know, very dramatically in the case of either country. Um, this viewer is asking, you have talked a lot about conspiracy theories in the context of media, both social and large scale. Would you be able to talk about why this specific moment in history of liberal democracy is so rife with these conspiracies? Is there something about where we are now culturally that makes them so infectious? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I'm not sure that I've got a terribly good uh, answer to it. I think that in general, the rise of populism is based on you know the single broadest uh, and, and most useful definition of populism is the belief that there is an elite conspiracy uh, that is operating uh, against the interests of ordinary people. Uh, and when people are dissatisfied with their lives, uh, you know, they, uh, they turn to this, but it doesn't really explain why uh, this happened in the second half of the second decade of the 21st century, because you know, conspiracy theories have been around in the United States. The John, you know, when I was a little, the John Birch Society was promoting conspiracy theories of all sorts, but it doesn't seem to have taken off uh, to the extent that let's say QAnon has uh, over the past year. Now, one thing could just be leadership that, you know, in ages past, you didn't have the president of the United States basically supporting um, conspiracy theories and, uh, you know, when you have somebody at that level who is a charismatic leader to many millions of Americans saying uh, um, uh, that he thinks that QAnon is basically just a patriotic organization, then a lot of people are going to listen to him and you know follow him down that path. Um, there's definitely a, a, a technology component to this because we are so overwhelmed with information right now. Uh, you know, motivated reasoning is, I think, at the core of a lot of this, that we don't actually process empirical information the way our rational choice models tell us we do. Uh, we, we start out with the conclusions that we want to reach, and we look for information that supports that conclusion. Uh, and the internet has given us this wealth of alternative facts that you know, can suit any particular point of view. So right now, if you do a Google search for evidence of fraud in the November 2020 election, you'll get tens of thousands of hits. You know, you'll be completely overwhelmed with information. Um, you know, virtually all of it false, but you'll still see it there. And if you want to believe that there was fraud in that election, you're going to get fed, you know, uh, tons of information. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, the sheer availability of alternative sources of information have also contributed to this uh, in a big way. Definitely. Um, all right, I think this is an interesting question to end on. To what extent do you think the concern about China is driven internally versus externally? Before the Trump administration's anti-China policies, there were not a high degree of threats and confrontation perceived from China. But since then, attitudes have changed a lot from the rest of the world towards China. How would the dynamic in dealing with China be triggered by the anti-China policy from Trump? Well, the only way, I mean, so I think the blame for this deterioration uh, uh, in relations really lies very heavily uh, uh, in, in China's court uh, and is really related to you know, the preferences of Xi Jinping. Uh, one thing that happened internally is that a lot of the American business community that had seen China as, you know, the, the future, uh, their biggest future markets, a lot of them have gotten very disabused uh, because they've had their intellectual property stolen. They found themselves closed out of many Chinese markets where Chinese uh, companies had access to the American market, so there wasn't reciprocity. And so now, apart from the big internet platforms and Wall Street, a lot of corporate America has really lost its enthusiasm for China. 
and they used to be, uh, you know, among the biggest advocates of, you know, friendly relations, engagement, uh, so on and so forth. And so, in that respect, I think the domestic, you know, interest groups have have shifted their opinions. But I don't think that should distract us from the fact that, you know, the real changes uh, have been going on the Chinese side. I mean, the militarization of the South China Sea. Uh, was not done by domestic American actors. You know, this is something that uh, uh, China is 100% uh, responsible for. Okay, well, uh, Matilda and Francis, do you have any closing thoughts for us? Well, um, I must just say uh, thank you. And of course, I must uh, recommend both the Harvard Bookstore and uh, and of course the book, uh, and uh, and also as uh, uh, Francis here said, uh, the the blog and what's uh, that the platform where many many other interesting articles can be found on many of these topics, the American purpose, and uh, also uh, thank you for every from everyone listening to this, and uh, probably you get a big picture of uh, all the things that uh, Francis Fukuyama has said and thought about for the past 30 years, which is quite <laughs> a lot. Okay, and I want to thank Matilda for uh, putting the book together in the Harvard Bookstore for, uh, for inviting us today. So thanks a lot, and to everybody for attending. Yes. Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. And thank you, Francis and Matilda, for this fascinating conversation. Please check out After the End of History and purchase the copy on harvard.com. And from all of us at Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great rest of your day. Keep reading and please be well. Thank you so much.